Okay, hello everyone. Um, today we have our last lecture for the water course. So we have Dr. Andre here to give a lecture. So I will have very brief introduction of her. Um, Dr. Andre is a senior lecturer in the School of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. And she has been working on the development of sustainable processes for water and wastewater treatment, like the uh, trees contaminant removal and biofouling and membrane cleaning and the biological treatment processes. So I guess her talk today will be about the wastewater uh, bioremediation mm -hmm. with algae. So welcome, and Andrew. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to give this lecture. Um, what I'll do now is that I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop the video just, just to let you know, and I'm going to start the presentation because I need to use my bigger screen. So I'm hoping you can see me. I think so. Perfect, the, can, can you see everything? Everything's okay. Yeah, everything's okay. Oh, okay, you perfect. Well, your, your PPT. Okay. So the, the talk I'll give today is about uh, uh, wastewater bioremediation using uh, filamentous uh, algae. And uh, the content, sorry, my button isn't working. Just give me a second. Okay. Uh, so the content of, of the lecture will first cover uh, the main driver for the usage of, of, or one of the main drivers for the usage of macroalgae bioremediation in wastewater, which is actually aquaculture industry. Then I'll cover the work that we've done on testing the rationale for using microalgae bioremediation for uh, aquaculture wastewater treatment. Then we did some work on developing methods to quantify macroalgae growth because we realized that there were no standard methods for this developed uh, until we did uh, our, uh, the work that we've done. Um, and then once this has been developed and we can quantify macroalgae growth, then we studied the nutrient bioremediation capability of uh, macroalgae. So this will be the content of, of the lecture. So starting with the background and the justification for why there is a driver for this, which is the uh, uh, aquaculture industry, which is one of them. Uh, as you can see, um, there has been a, a, a growth in the human population, which combined with the over-exploitation of uh, wild fish stocks has resulted in two things. In the first one that you can see on this side here, it has resulted in the stagnation in captures from uh, fisheries, wild fisheries, as you can see on this graph. And it has also caused, because of this stagnation and the increase in human population, it has caused an exponential uh, increase in aquaculture industry that you can see on the left-hand side graph. So just to give you an idea of the numbers, uh, the UN has projected a population increase up to 10 billion people by 2050. And as a consequence, the Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that aquaculture production will double in size uh, over the next few uh, decades to keep with the required demand. In the particular case of Scotland, which is where I'm uh, based at, uh, Scotland is the third world uh, largest producer of salmon alone, and it is expected that uh, finfish, which in includes salmon, and shellfish production will increase by 25% and 100% in the next few years, again to meet the uh, increased demand due to an uh, a growth of the population and uh, um, a stagnation in captures from uh, wild uh, fisheries. Now, the problem with aquaculture, as you can see here in this table, is that the affluence from aquaculture, from a fin fish or shrimp uh, farming, for example, can be very high in uh, nutrient uh, loading. So this, inc this includes uh, ammonium, nitrate, nitrite, uh, dissolved organic uh, nitrogen, dissolved inorganic uh, nitrogen as a, as a, as a, a family, uh, as well as phosphates. So you can see here, that actually these values can be quite high compared to the target values uh, for uh, the disposal of aquaculture effluents in uh, shrimp farming. So there are uh, several problems associated with this. Uh, obviously, one of them is that these nutrients can um, have uh, severe impacts on uh, human health, so they can cause gastric 
uh, cancer, uh, fetal mal malformation and, de and death if they have very high concentration. So for example, if uh, nitrite has a concentration um, higher than 0.5 milligrams per liter in the environment, this can be an issue. Uh, but it also causes the so-called eutrophication process. In, uh, in the summarized way, what happens is that if you have a high nutrient load uh, into a body of water, this will cause the growth of algae, as you can see here. Then what happens is that uh, some of the, this algae will die and decay and will be de decomposed by bacteria. When the decomposition by the bacteria occurs, uh, for them, for the bacteria to decompose, they need to consume oxygen. So there will be a high depletion of oxygen in the water body, which uh, if it reaches a value uh, lower than two milligrams of oxygen per liter, it can have very severe consequences and kill uh, everything that might be in that uh, water body. So the, 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 the contamination itself of the nutrients is a problem. The consequences of the contamination of the nutrients caused by eutrophication is also a problem. And here you can see the, the uh, uh, two uh, satellite images of eutrophication in the natural environment. So in this one here, you can see Lake Erie in uh, the USA, which has a uh, eutrophication problem covering a surface area of 21,000 kilometers square and the same happening uh, in the Baltic Sea, which covers an area of 84,000 kilometers square. So obviously what needs to happen is that the aquaculture effluents need to be properly treated so they don't get disposed into the environment and cause these uh, severe um, issues. Now the conventional processes for aquaculture wastewater treatment are very uh, uh, summarized and simplified, I have to, to, to say that, in this diagram here. So you're farming your fish or your shellfish or whatever animal that you're uh, farming in an aquaculture environment. You are feeding these animals. Uh, so the, 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 some of the food will not be eaten by the animals and therefore will constitute uh, waste. And the animals will also excrete uh, feces, for example, which will also constitute the waste. So in general, the kind of treatment that you will have will be a mechanical uh, filter, which will remove the largest particles that are in the wastewater, uh, so uneaten food and uh, large uh, particles of feces, which can then be, which then need to be disposed of or used for com composting, for example. And then you have to deal with the dissolved uh, the compounds. Uh, so this can be uh, organic matter, this can be nutrients like uh, nitrate, nitrite, etc. And usually you would use a biological filter, such as the one represented here, which would deal with these dissolved uh, nutrients and uh, biodegradable matter in general. So once this has been treated, then the water can be, uh, uh, in, in a simplified way, can be recycled back into the fish tanks or, or, or other animals to be uh, reused. Now, the problem is that usually these conventional treatments, which are very simplified here, uh, can be quite energy intensive. They can require sometimes chemicals uh, to be added to the system, and they can also produce uh, secondary wastes, such as uh, this one here, or uh, byproducts, and in some cases, uh, toxic sludge, if you use, for example, coagulation, uh, flocculation, and sedimentation. So, there has been a driver to move from these conventional processes into the so-called integrated multitrophic aquaculture uh, systems. So there has been a new uh, directive in the EU in 2016, which is called the Marine Strategies Framework Directive, which has uh, included IMTA as a process to uh, exploit and implement to treat aquaculture uh, wastewater effluents in order to avoid the problems of pollution from the effluents and of the conventional treatments uh, usually used. So uh, an IMTA system is basically represented here in this, uh, in this uh, figure. So you have the farming of the animal so there will be some uneaten food and feces, which will not, uh, which will constitute uh, the waste. So you'll have large particulate organic matter or small particular organic matter. And you will basically have uh, different uh, animals of a lower trophic level uh, in a sequential way, 
which will deal with this waste. So you can have, for example, invertebrates here, which can deal with large particular organic matter. You can have a shellfish, which can deal with small particulate organic matter. And then you will have uh, dissolved nutrients uh, like uh, nitrate, nitrite, etc., in which you can use algae to deal with these uh, dissolved uh, nutrients. So not only are you treating the water uh, and removing the, the pollution issue, but you're also producing a, by a byproduct out of it, uh, of which you can then uh, sell, such as uh, shellfish, uh, which can be used for food, for example, or seaweed, which can have many different applications in uh, food, in uh, making agar, in bioenergy production, etc. So there is the, the, the potential to incorporate uh, treating water and reusing it, depending on the system you're looking at, as well as uh, producing a byproduct out of it. So there has been a few studies looking into this part here of integrating macroalgae in an IMTA system, which is uh, what we uh, explored in uh, the project that we worked on. So if you look at the literature of macroalgae implementation in an IMTA system, you can see that the growth rates for uh, different types of macroalgae, so green and red macroalgae in this case, and the nutrient uptake for uh, these uh, uh, algae in an IMTA system varies quite uh, substantially. So the growth rates of the algae that you can see in the literature have ranged from 0.4 to 18% uh, per day of growth rate, whilst the end removal that you can see here ha has ranged from uh, 2.4 and 99% uh, per uh, day. So there is a, a high variability in the performance of using macroalgae in an IMTA system, because obviously there's different uh, fish that you're using, which will excrete and feed uh, differently, different seasonalities, different um, uh, algae species that have been uh, uh, tested different nitrogenous uh, inputs depending on the feeding regimes etc so it's a very complex system it has shows a, it has showed a high variability but on the other hand it, it also has showed quite a, a, a positive and promising uh, um, way of incorporating of using macroalgae uh, incorporated in uh, an IMTA system and therefore deserves to be explored uh, further so what we did was uh, we decided to exploit uh, the usage of macroalgae in an IMTA system, but focusing more on the uh, species of Cladophora, which is a, a filamentous macroalgae. So there isn't a, a lot on, uh, on, uh, on, on this particular uh, species. So we focused on this. And the reason why you focused on this was, uh, um, or several actually. So you can see here uh, um, species, different species of uh, Cladophora. So uh, Cladophora is a macroalgae, is a filamentous macroalgae, and it has many different advantages. It's usually associated in uh, eutrophicated uh, environments, so it can cope with high loads of, of nutrients, which is great if we want to use it for wastewater treatment. And it is regarded as a, a pest species. So it's very robust and it uh, shows up in many different places throughout uh, the globe. So just to let you know, there's been blooms in the Great Lakes in North America, in the Lake District in England, in Bermuda, in Massachusetts, etc. And you can see here in Scotland in, and in the UK in particular, they have been uh, uh, Clodophora has been uh, spotted all over the coast, but also in environments of brackish and freshwater as well. So they can be found everywhere. They are very resistant. They have high rates of growth and uh, they form very dense algal uh, mats. So they, are, they thrive particularly in nutrient enriched uh, conditions. And despite sometimes not being the species that uh, removes the highest quantity of uh, nutrient, it's actually found to be the dominant species in these environments. And it's thought to be because it can actually uptake different types of uh, nitrogenous species, for example. So different forms that the end species might be, um, might be present in the uh, environment. Another advantage for wastewater treatment is that it's very uh, resistant to herbivory. 
uh, so to potential grazers because the 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 wall is uh, a highly crushed uh, crystalline cellulose and uh, hemicellulose and it uh, synthesizes toxic fatty acids which uh, makes them uh, unpalatable uh, to to grazers so the grazers don't actually particularly enjoy to eat um, and graze on the, the cladophora. So they are very resistant and also why they're so uh, ubiqu uh, ubiquitous in the uh, environment. Uh, also because they are filamentous uh, in morphology, this can help uh, enhancing the nutrient removal when you compare with seaweed, for example. And it also facilitates the, the harvesting, as you can see from the pictures in the slides, compared to microalgae. So it's easier, obviously, to harvest these, uh, this type of biomass compared to microalgae, which can be quite small. So the first thing that we did was to test the rationale for using uh, cladophora in, uh, uh, for wastewater treatment in an aquaculture. Uh, environment. So we did a screening test to start off with. So we focused on uh, Cladophora colorthrix and Cladophora parudii. And we just did multi-well uh, plates with uh, a certain volume of the experimental growth medium. We did 14 days of experiments except for salinity, which lasted a bit longer because the growth rate was a bit slower. And we did everything in, under a septic condition. So we were only using these forms of uh, cladophora. This is Michael, who actually did uh, the work, which I am uh, very happy to present. Uh, so as a baseline, we basically incubated the algae in these well plates at 24 uh, degrees Celsius and 100 RPM. We use an 18 uh, uh, ratio to six hours of uh, light dark for the, the algae to uh, grow. And we use as a baseline uh, Guillard's F2, um, F2 media, which has an initial concentration of uh, nitrate of 868 uh, micromolars uh, and a concentration of phosphate of 21 micromolars. And we used artificial seawater uh, with a concentration of 33.5 grams per liter. So this was the baseline we used. And then we basically tested changing different conditions such as temperature and light, uh, concentrations of the uh, nutrients, as well as the concentration of the salt to see the impact that this had on the macroalgal uh, algal growth and nutrient, uh, nutrient uptake capability. So as I mentioned, what we varied was nutrient concentration. We also varied the pH, we varied the salinity and the temperature and daylight hours to see how robust and how, uh, how the macroalgae coped with any possible changes in these conditions. So when we changed the concentrations of the nutrients, we basically started with the baseline of the Guillard's uh, F2 uh, medium, which has these concentrations of um, nitrogen and uh, uh, phosphorus. And then we basically just doubled every time to see how the macroalgal coped with uh, increasing in concentration and we kept everything else the same. Then we also did experiments of changing the pH where everything was the same and the only thing that we changed was the pH by adjusting with hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide. We also tested changes in uh, salinity where everything else again was the same and the only thing that we changed and tested were different concentrations of salt. And finally, we tested different seasonalities uh, by mimicking spring, summer and winter. So what this, uh, what this causes is uh, a change in the temperature and daylight exposure from winter conditions to spring conditions by increasing these. And then from spring to summer, the only difference is that we increase the temperature from 18 to 24 uh, degrees. So we incubated these in all of these different conditions uh, in uh, Petri dishes, as you can see here. We measured the nutrient concentrations to see how, uh, uh, what uptakes uh, did we obtain. We also measured the fresh weight to see what kind of growth we, uh, of the algae uh, we obtained. And the growth was quantified uh, using this equation, um, which is provided in the literature, which is proportional to uh, the final and the initial fresh weight obtained at the beginning and at the end of the experiment, as well as proportional to the number of days in which the algal was growth, which in this case was 14. So we did these experiments. So the first thing that we tested, as I mentioned, was the effect of, of uh, nutrient concentration in 
the media. So what we could see was that uh, there was a, a, um, an increase in the, the growth and nutrient uptake for uh, both species studied. So this graph here presents the growth and these graphs here present the uh, nitrate and phosphate uptake by the two species that we've studied. Uh, so we can see that uh, the growth of parudii, which is presented in black, uh, in all, yes, in all of the graphs, was greater than the growth for coelothrix. So you can see that, for example, uh, other trends that we notice is that, uh, as you can see in the blue circle, the rate of growth of parudii increased from roughly 8% per day, as you can see here, for a media of F slash 2 and F, uh, up to almost doubling um, a growth of uh, up to 13% per day when cultivated in uh, 2F and 4F media, which is uh, three and four times F divided by uh, two. As you can see, this pattern of increase in growth rate was also mir mirrored in the increase of uh, nitrate uh, uptake. So here where the growth rate was uh, low, the nitrate uptake was also lower, around 400 micromolar. But as soon as the growth rate increased, as you can see here, the nitrate uptake increased as well up to uh, 2,500 micromolar roughly. And the exact same happened with phosphate, which show a more gradual increase in uptake between 20 here and 90 micromolar. Similar trends were ob observed for uh, coelothrix for, not, uh, for nitrate uptake, for example, but there was a small variation in growth rate as compared to parudii. So there was a suggestion that whilst parudii is strongly influenced by the nutrient regime and uptake in which it is uh, uh, immersed in, uh, coelothrix uh, may be more affected by other uh, abiotic factors that we didn't study and we didn't optimize, such as temperature and light. So whilst the factors we used for um, parudii might have been optimal, for its operation and therefore it was sensitive to changes in nutrient uh, changes. The same uh, did not happen for the uh, coelothrix um, uh, species. So then we studied the uh, effect of the media pH and in this case it's not incredibly exciting what happened with, for pH uh, for pH is higher than five. So we can see that the growth rates are very similar and they don't change uh, substantially between pH 5 and 11, and the same happens for the uptake at these pHs of nitrate, which are very high, and uh, phosphate. So nitrate uptakes were higher than 93% for parudii and higher than 97% for coelothrix, whilst phosphate removal was higher than 77%, as you can see here, for parudii and higher than 99% for coelothrix. So a, high, a pH higher than five, it's consistent, uh, high uh, uh, consistent growth rates and high removals of uh, N and uh, P-based nutrients. However, if you look here at the blue circle, as soon as a pH uh, becomes very acidic and very low, so close to uh, three in this case, we can see that we have a negative growth rate, uh, which means that uh, uh, the, the initial biomass uh, died um, and therefore the biomass that we had at the end of 14 days was lower than what we started off with, which is also mirrored by a much lower uptake of nitrate and phosphate compared to the other pH conditions for which it was very high. So one of the possible reasons for this is that uh, in the case of uh, cyanobacteria, for example, these usually prefer alkaline environments and they are usually absent in acidic regions uh, of pH below four. Uh, and this is thought to be because it, they have a sensitivity uh, of their uh, photosynthetic pigments. Um, which can be unstable in acidic conditions. So the same might be happening with, um, with the, the macroalgae species that we studied here, where this pH uh, causes, uh, causes them the photosynthetic mechanism not to happen anymore, and therefore they end up dying if they don't uh, grow. Uh, parudii seem to be more sensitive 
as you can see here, at a lower pH and at a high pH compared to uh, Coelothrix. And this could be because Coelothrix has a much uh, thicker and uh, recalcitrant cell wall uh, compared to Perudii, which might offer it some protection against uh, very acidic or very uh, alkaline um, conditions. So once we studied the, the, the effect of pH, we also wanted to see the effect of uh, salinity. Once again, as for pH, uh, uh, usually the growth rates were uh, very stable and uh, for the, 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 the very high range of salinities that we actually test, tested, these were our marine species. Uh, so they cope well with a, a, high, a wide range of uh, salinities and they removed a very high to very high degree the nutrients present in the um, in the media again there was only one exception as there was for the ph which was salinities of zero where we thought of testing uh, conditions close to freshwater to see how clodophora uh, would cope since they coped well with uh, lower concentrations of salinity than they usual uh, used to uh, but what we observed is that the growth rate was, uh, again, very low or even negative, and the uptake of nitrate and uh, phosphate was very low as well. And this is probably caused by uh, um, osmotic imbalance uh, between the, the Clodophora cell wall and the media, which had absolutely no uh, salts in it. Um, so as a result of this uh, osmotic imbalance, the, the, the cells can swell and they can burst and they can expel their uh, contents, uh, resulting therefore in a net increase in the nutrient concentration, which might explain why we had negative values of nutrients. So because they die and they open up and, and, and um, burst, they can actually release some nutrients into the media. So they're, they're very uh, robust for a high range of salinities, but they cannot cope uh, with uh, absolutely no presence of salinity whatsoever in the media, which obviously reduces their application for uh, uh, aquaculture that uses freshwater um, animals. And uh, finally, the, the final um, parameter that we looked at was uh, seasonality, as you can see here. So basically what we obtain is that with an increase in uh, uh, light time as well as temperature, we had an increase in the growth rate of the, um, of the algae, which was reflected on an increase of the nutrient uptake uh, as well. So the, the temperature and daylight hours are uh, key factors for the, the, the well-being and, and the, the, the uh, reproduction and, and um, of the macroalgae. So they will influence the rates of photosynthesis. Uh, temperature can uh, influence the ion equilibrium in solutions such as uh, ammonia and ammonium equilibrium, for example. It can also influence the solubility of CO2 and O2 uh, in the water, which will affect how much CO2 is available for the algae to uptake, as well as other aspects of algal metabolism. So obviously the ideal scenario for this particular algae is the uh, summer uh, period with uh, very uh, long hours of light as well as 24 degrees Celsius, as you can see here. So uh, a fairly high temperature uh, for them to, uh, to thrive more compared to the winter months. But in many aquaculture um, uh, farming methods, uh, the temperatures for, for the animals that are being farmed can actually be quite high. So temperatures of 28 to grow shrimp, for example, uh, are often used. So the wastewater that would be treated by uh, algae would be at this, uh, at this temperature of 28 degrees anyway. The, 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 there would have to be potentially if supply, depending on where you are, uh, of uh, light though. But the temperature, it de it depending on what you're farming, you can actually uh, be dealing with uh, high temperatures anyway. So you might not have to uh, warm up the water. So once we've tested the, the, the rationale of using Clodophora for wastewater treatment, what we could see is that the growth was high and was consistent in uh, uh, most cases, as well as a high nutrient uh, removal and almost complete in many of the um, uh, parameters that we tested. There were exceptions, which were mainly in extreme conditions of very low pH, of no salinity, and of winter season, which has a low temperature and low uh, daylight hours. Uh, 
So Clodoffer showed promise for uh, bioremediation uh, purposes, uh, and therefore we uh, extended and continued uh, uh, the study of uh, implementing these for uh, aquaculture wastewater bioremediation. But first we realized that we actually, to be able to understand how Cladophora is impacted by different nutrients and how much it will grow. We obviously want to be able to measure growth rate uh, um, during a certain amount of time. So we realized there was not a standard harvesting process uh, which allowed us to do this. Um, so that's something that we had to work on, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. And then once we had this process, which allowed us to harvest the algae to be able to quantify growth rate uh, with time, then we examined the influence of different uh, nutrient regimes, uh, nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, uh, uh, nitrogen sources, uh, etc. So talking about the, the, the harvesting process that allows us to quantify growth, uh, I think I've jumped, yes. Uh, as I've mentioned, the, the, it, it's very important for us to be able to quantify growth because we want to see how much biomass will we be producing with time and how much will we obtain at the end so that we can reuse this biomass for other purposes such as bioenergy production, uh, food manufacturing, uh, etc. If we want to see what is the impact of certain uh, uh, pollutants, for example, on the growth and viability of the biomass, we also want to be able to assess what the growth rate is for a certain amount of time. So we need to be able to assess how much biomass we have. Um, and we also needed to optimize uh, uh, the process of using uh, macroalgae for uh, bioremediation uh, purposes to uh, enhance it as much as possible in regards to remediation as well as biomass uh, production. So this requires the uh, development of standardized uh, methods for growth determination, uh, which then al allows us to compare uh, the impact of different parameters onto the uh, algae itself. But as I mentioned, there was no standardized approach uh, to do this, so that is something that we had to work on. So just to give you an idea, microalgae, as you can see here, is usually unicellular and uh, uh, forms a uniform suspension in uh, the media. So you can usually uh, use different methods to quantify how much biomass is in it by using, for example, a, a emocytometer, which allows us to do a cell counting, or using absorbance or light scattering methods for which absorbance uh, obtained will be proportional to a certain concentration of cells, um, of microalgal cells in the solution. So microalgae, the, the, these methods still have their, their issues as well, don't get me wrong, but these are uh, fairly standard and adopted methods for microalgae quantification. In the case of seaweeds, such as like kelp, for example, as you can see here, which are absolutely huge, uh, usually the methods are just directly using a ruler to measure the length of uh, the fronds. So you can actually either measure the whole uh, frond of the seaweed or if you want to know the rate of growth, you can use the hole and punch method where you put a hole uh, at the, um, here at the base of the front, for example. Then you come back a month afterwards and you put another hole and you measure the distance between these two holes and that gives you the growth rate of the algae. So this is fairly straightforward for microalgae and for seaweeds, but for filamentous macroalgae, such as the Clodophora that we were using in the study, it's not that straightforward. So uh, filamentous algae, such as Clodophora that we studied are multicellular, uh, multifarous, and often quite fragile, uh, which makes the, the, the accurate growth rate determination uh, quite challenging. So obviously optical methods cannot be used to quantify biomass uh, growth because they, there's not a uniform, as you can see from the pictures, there's not a uniform suspension of the material, which allows us to get a relationship between the biomass and absorbance, for example. A conventional method used is drying the biomass in an oven to remove all the water and then weigh and then simply weighing this. 
but obviously that means that you have to um, sacrifice the whole of the biomass to be able to know how much it grew by. So knowing growth rates in a certain amount of time is either not possible or requires the, the, the sacrificing all the samples and therefore having uh, uh, many repeats of uh, the samples that are sacrificed from time to time. So temporal measurements of growth are very difficult for uh, the, the macroalgae using dry weight, or actually they are possible, but they require a lot of resources. Um, fresh weight on the other hand, which is uh, uh, basically just weighing the, the live biomass by collecting it from the vials, as you can see here, uh, is possible, but there isn't a standard method. So filter paper is usually used to remove any water that might be in the, in the, the biomass. And then the fresh weight is simply uh, weighed in uh, a balance. However, uh, the, the, usually the types of filter papers and the time used for this are not specified. Uh, and therefore there will be differences in the water that is removed. There might be also problems as we noticed from the study that we did in the end that there might be a viability compromise of the algae itself when using filter papers or pressing, uh, which obviously will impact on the results. So when you, you, you think that maybe it's a contaminant that is uh, um, um, affecting the viability of the algae, it might actually be the process of harvesting and determining the growth rate that is actually having huge implications. So methods to determine the growth rates of uh, multicellular filamentous microalgae were required, which is what we studied. So we tested three different microalgal species, two marine and one freshwater, which are quite different in aspect, as you can see here. So Coelothrix grows slowly in these very tight clusters, and they have very thick cell walls. Parudia, as you can see here, grows quickly in a loose uh, skin, so it has its central uh, part and core, but it has all these filaments that come out of it. And then we have Spirogyra, which again has a central uh, biomass core, uh, but then it has filaments that also grow towards the water surface. But uh, Spirogyra is actually much more uh, fragile and it can fragment uh, if it is disturbed as opposed to uh, the Clodophora species. So what we did is that we grew them in uh, uh, septic conditions for 14 days before, uh, after being acclimatized for seven days in the relevant uh, media that we used. Uh, then we did regular fresh water determination with different methods that I will uh, show uh, to compare uh, uh, growth rates. And then we measured dry weight at the end of the 14 days to see how much actual biomass we were producing once all the water had been dried and removed from the biomass. We also measured nitrate and phosphate to see uh, a relationship between uh, viability and uh, uptake of the nutrients. And we determined the carbohydrate content of the biomass to see if the harvesting method had any impact on the, the, um, the content of the biomass itself. Uh, because stress can uh, affect microalgae, for example, and it can affect how much lipids are produced. So we wanted to see if the same happened with the macroalgae. So we tested many different harvesting methods, as you can see from this uh, table. So the, 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 we used a reticulated spinner, which was basically a satellite spinner from uh, uh, a supermarket, as you can see here. So we put the biomass in and we used centrifugation to remove uh, water and obtain uh, fresh weight. We also used Filter paper, which is commonly uh, used to, uh, uh, for fresh weight measurements. We did combinations of reticulated spinner and filter paper. We also uh, squeezed them between microscope slides to try to remove water as well. And for the uh, spirogyra in particular, we used a, a perforated crucible, which is a, 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 a sort of a filter, but with, with fairly, with, fairly big openings in, in the uh, millimeter uh, size, but, but small. And then we also tested putting them through the perforated crucible and then using the reticulated spinner that I showed in the picture a few minutes ago. So we tested all of these to see 
how was, uh, what kind of fresh water we obtained, how much dewatering did we manage to get, and we studied the viability, the, the effect on the viability of the algae of all of these different methods. The first thing that we did, and I'm not going to go into detail, was optimize the, the reticulated spinner by uh, optimizing the number of times that we needed to spin it, and the optimized value was 90 seconds. So 15 seconds uh, slots for a total of 90 seconds were used to uh, uh, um, uh, dewater the algae that we tested because that was the maximum value. There wasn't much change after 90 seconds. And once we've optimized the reticulated spinner, then we obtained the uh, fresh weight, the final fresh weight, which is what this graph shows, the final fresh weight to dry weight ratios for the different species we tested and the different methods that we used for harvesting. So what happens is that the lower the fresh water to dry weight ratio, the more efficient the dewatering method uh, should be. So the closer it should be to the actual biomass that you produce in theory. Uh, also, the size of the error bars of the different methods that we use will also indicate how reproducible each method is. So if there is a, a high variability, then it, becomes, it might become difficult to see any changes in uh, growth rate. I can see I am taking longer than I thought. So the main trends that we could see is that if we use um, a perforated crucible or measure the fresh weight directly in, uh, of the algae in uh, a balance, this requires the least mechanical effort, but the ratios of fresh weight to dry weight were actually, uh, that we obtained were actually very high. So this indicates that the dewatering was not very uh, efficient. There is still a lot of water in the biomass. And the error bars were also quite big, which makes it unpredictable with the water carryover between different measurements. And therefore, determining the growth rate might be quite difficult. Then if you look at using filter paper to uh, dewater and remove water from the algae, which is basically just pressing the biomass with an absorbent filter paper, you can see that the ratios of fresh weight to dry weight are very low. So less than 10 for variants and less than four for Cladophora. So it's a great dewatering method. And there's also very low error throughout. So this seems to indicate that filter paper might be a good method to use to determine, to remove water then weigh the biomass for fresh weight determination and use this for growth rate uh, uh, assessment. The, uh, using the reticulated spinner, uh, which removes the water uh, centrifugally, uh, shows that the fresh water to dry weight ratios were uh, lower than the, the, the blue methods that we used, but higher than the red ones uh, that we used, which involved the filter paper. So that shows that it's not as efficient in removing water as the filter paper, but it was very reproducible and had a very low error. So from this, what we assume is that the filter paper is probably the best harvesting method to determine temporal changes in freshwater or freshwater growth. But actually, what happened is that when we looked at the final dry weight that we obtained, uh, which gives us how much actual biomass we produced. Sorry. Oh, well, I thought I heard someone speaking. Uh, how much biomass we uh, produced. What we could see is that for the uh, uh, spirogyra, because the filaments are very thin and fragile, and they were uh, fragmented if they were agitated, swirled, uh, or swirled, and they could lose biomass. Uh, the quantity of dry weight we obtained at the end, which is actual biomass, uh, was uh, getting lower and lower because we were losing it through the reticulated spinner and we were losing it when using the uh, filter paper. So although the, 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 the ratios of fresh water to dry weight are low, we're also losing a lot of biomass. Uh, this was actually avoided when we agglomerated the biomass first through the, the perforated crucible and then harvested with the reticulated spinner. So this allowed us to not lose as much biomass uh, as compared to the other harvesting methods. When we looked at the uh, Cladophora species, what we can see is that for both of them, of the Cladophora species, the final dry weight that we obtain 
reduces with the application of using filter paper, which are these two methods here. So this one, and this one, as well as this one, and this one. And this was especially the case for uh, parudii and less for uh, coelothrix, because coelothrix has a, a thicker cell wall. It grows in tightly uh, uh, tight clusters, and therefore it has a, a more protection of uh, the cells compared to parudii, which has all these filaments that grow uh, outwards and therefore are exposed to the, the, the different systems that we use to harvest them. So what this indicated is that whilst we would like to have a, a low fresh weight to dry weight ratio, uh, because that removes as much water as possible, as is the case for the filter paper, actually the filter paper also causes a low growth as well, translated by low final dry weight values that we obtain. So there's a suggestion that the, the method used to harvest and measure fresh water can actually damage the macroalgae. So I'll just have, I have to have a couple more slides. Unfortunately, I won't be able to go uh, into the detail of the nutrient uptake, which I apologize, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish at least this part very quickly. So there is an indication there is a damage depending on the harvesting method that you use to measure fresh weight and determine growth rate, which, uh, was, which is shown in this slide here. So we have here the different species that we looked at. Then we had a positive control, which was not subjected to any harvesting methods. We had uh, samples that were, ex that were subjected to the reticulated spinner for the cladophora or the perforated crucible and reticulated spinner for the uh, spirogyra. And we have images of uh, the exposure with filter paper. And what we can see is that in the control, they look healthy and undamaged filaments. Uh, they have their characteristic uh, block type cells, as you can see here. So they're like different blocks, which are all joined together. And they have a typical green coloration. And there is even some branching in some of the images, as you can see, which shows that there has been growth. When you look at uh, this harvesting method, such as the reticulated spinner, you can see that it's very similar to the positive controls, which indicates that the reticulated spinner didn't have a, a damaging effect to the algae. Apart from here, as you can see, in some cases, you could see some damage from the algae, in this particular case, in the coelothrix. However, when looking at the images for when using filter paper, you can see um, that there was obvious damage to the cells, as you can see here, where cellular contents in some cases were expelled, as you can see in these particular places. And uh, um, the chloroplasts would be observed in large and discolored uh, aggregates attached outside of the cell wall. So they actually came out of uh, the cell wall. So, what this indicated to us is that there was a low growth rate when using filter paper, which means that the filter paper, which is used to remove water, is not just removing water from outside the cell wall, it's also removing water from inside the cell wall, damaging the algae, and therefore uh, using this method to quantify growth rate might be a problem because the method itself is uh, jeopardizing the, the, the viability of the algae. So you wouldn't know if it's the method uh, if it's the contaminant that you're exposing your algae that is uh, affecting its viability, or if it's the harvesting method that is being uh, used. So the nutrient uptake also reflects this. So as you can see from the red arrows, the algae the, that were subjected to protocols with mechanical pressing, which include filter paper, uh, had the lowest nutrient uptakes, as you can see in the red arrows, compared to the control, which weren't exposed to anything. Uh, no harvesting methods, whilst uh, when you compare the reticulated spinner used for uh, all the species with the control, you can see that they had similar nutrient uptake capability. So this correlates well with the fact that uh, when you use the reticulated spinner, the growth rates were, were good, they were high, and therefore the nutrient uptake was high as well, so it was proportional. We didn't notice any difference in the uh, carbohydrate uh, content of the biomass by using the different uh, methods. 
so there is no implication on the biomass content by the different methods used. The, the, what happens is that the methods can affect the viability of the macroalgae uh, itself, not its uh, actual content. Uh, and just to finalize this part, unfortunately, I won't be able to continue because I am already going over my time. Uh, so once we optimize the, the method and we realize the best method to use that uh, dewatered uh, uh, as much as possible uh, the, the biomass and uh, did not affect uh, its viability, what we wanted to do was to assess if uh, measuring fresh water at different periods in time uh, correlated with measurements of dry weight obtained for different periods in time, so that instead of using growth rates based on dry weight measurements, which required uh, sacrificing the sample completely, if we could use growth rates of freshwater measurements uh, instead. So what we did was we uh, inoculated the algae in uh, the usual way. So we had 15 flasks to start off with. We uh, um, harvested these 15 flasks always with the same method. So for Cladophora, we use the reticulated spinner. For uh, Spirogyra, we use uh, the perforated crucible with the reticulated spinner as well. And then we weighed all of these to determine the fresh weight values. Then three flasks were sacrificed to determine dry weight, whilst the rest was sent and put back into the incubator so that it was incubated for a few more days. Then they were again subjected to this uh, cycle. So we determined the growth rates for freshwater and dry weight measurements, again, based on this equation and based on collection of biomass for, uh, for day zero, three, five, 10, and 14. So this is what we uh, obtained in uh, fresh weight uh, and dry weight for the different species that we studied. So we can see that there is a very strong positive relationship between the fresh weight for all the species that we studied and the dry weight, which translates into very similar growth rates comparing where, uh, fresh weight with dry weight, which means that uh, dry weight is, 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 is a very uh, reliable way of knowing how much biomass you have, but because it involves sacrificing the biomass, it's not a great way to determine growth rates. Therefore, fresh weights by using this method that we developed actually provides us with very similar values of growth rate as using dry weight um, wood. So the method that we used and developed can be used to uh, measure fresh weight and determine the growth rate of the algae for uh, different points in time. Um, we also went uh, uh, a step further in which it, we, based on the freshwater measurements that we had here, we tried to predict how much dry weight we would obtain at each point, which are these values that you can see here, these crosses. And the way that we do this was basically using the fresh weight measurements that we had uh, for each point in time and the fresh weight to dry weight ratio that we determined in this slide here using the harvesting method that is relevant, in this case, using the reticulated spinner or the perforated crucible and reticulated spinner with the spirogyra. So this corresponds to ratio of 6.3, 8.6, and 19.3 for Coelothrix, Parudii, and variants. So using these ratios, fresh weight to dry weight ratio, and using the fresh weight measurements with time, we could apply this ratio to the fresh weight measurements with time and predict how much dry weight we would expect to obtain, which as you can see is very close to the actual dry weight measurements that we did obtain. So the, there is some small differences for coelothrix, but for perudii and variants, it is uh, spot on. Uh, I have a few slides on biomediation, but I assume I don't have time to go through them. Are you able to tell me, do I still have time or should I stop here? Um, I'm sorry, maybe we don't have Professor Sinjan uh, here, All she right. may miss, but I, I believe that it's almost one hour and yes, then okay. uh, we may keep some time for question if you would agree to do it so. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I, I went over time and I apologize. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you very much for your time. Um, 
So you, if you, I don't know, I don't know if you want to give a short conclusion or a summary before we go into question. Um, so what what we did um, we did see is that the the the, the Clodophora is um, so I'll I'll go to the so just to give you just give me a second. So we then tested, ju just to give you an overview, we then tested different uh, nutrient species, different nutrient concentrations and mixtures of nutrients for uh, the Clodophora. And what we could see is that uh, they could uptake, um, there were differences in growth and, and uptake uh, for the different species of Clodophora that we tested. Uh, so in one case, it was strongly, affect, one of them, Perudii, was strongly affected and influenced by the nutrient regime, as we saw in the, the preliminary experiments that we did. But um, the Coelothrix was, uh, did not have a high variation when we study different parameters. So again, it was an indication that there was uh, another parameter that might not have been optimized, uh, which doesn't uh, give it a high dependence on the nutrients that it was exposed to. So we did a, a more in-depth study using only Perudii um, by testing different mixtures of nutrients uh, in the media. And what we noticed is that there was complementary uptake of different nutrients, which is very good in the wastewater treatment uh, context because you'll have a different range of uh, nutrients. Um, and the growth was strongly influenced by the type of nutrient uh, that was in the solution uh, as opposed to the concentration of, it, of this nutrient. Uh, but there was preference in uptake for some nutrients compared to others. So ammonium, for example, had a preferential uptake uh, because uh, it is a reduced form and therefore requires a, a lower energetic, um, a lower energy for its assimilation as opposed to other types of nutrients. So there were disparities in the rate of uptake of the nutrients, depending on what nutrients mixtures you had in, um, in uh, the media. And there was actually an effect of this on uh, the final biomass uh, composition um, where uh, higher concentrations of uh, nutrients of N based nutrients, for example, uh, gave uh, a higher concentration of protein and consequential, consequentially uh, a, a, a lower uh, um, concentration in carbohydrates. Uh, and we also notice that if you have mixtures of urea in, in, uh, in the wastewater with other nutrients, you also have a very high uh, carbohydrate uh, content. Uh, and this is thought because it can actually, the mackerel can actually assimilate the, the organic form of, uh, that is uh, urea, uh, which can uh, reduce to uh, ammonium, which it uptakes, as well as uh, carbon dioxide, which it uses as well in uh, photosynthesis. So um, there, the, the, our studies show that they were very robust. Uh, they, they, they can cope with a lot of changes. They can cope with many different concentrations and many different mixtures. Uh, but the growth uh, and uh, especially the nutrient uptake um, of different nutrients depending on what kind of mixtures of nutrients you had. So more studies need to be obviously need to be carried out at a larger scale as well because the, the studies that we did were at a, a smaller scale. So larger scale uh, studies with uh, uh, need to be carried out as well as uh, with real wastewater, which we haven't done uh, yet. Um, so I think that was it. That was my uh, conclusion, which I apologize, it's a bit rushed. Um, but I am more than happy to discuss more at a different time uh, the, the rest of the work that we did. Awesome. Thank you for uh, thank you very much um, uh, for this compelling and very uh, complete lecture. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder if there is any uh, question for uh, yes. I think you got a question uh, from Verena. How do I? Yeah. Uh, could you just uh, if you uh, stop sh the the sharing the screen and you might oh. find the uh, chat. Hello? Yeah, do, oh, do you find the chat? Yeah, sorry. Do you find the chat um, buttons and close to the button the when you have the screen? Okay, yes, I can see it. Yeah, so normally you sh uh, there is two questions coming from our student. Oh, they're written. Sorry, I thought they would yeah, be sorry. oral. Oh, Apologies. no. Um, 
Uh, okay, sorry. Let me read it first. <laughs> yeah. Um, Could you see it? Yes, I can again. Uh, perfect. Yeah. No, we did not. Um, we d that's a very good question uh, from Verena. We did not test uh, species uh, interactions um, because we obviously there's always a limited amount of time. We were more interested uh, in, in this project in understanding if you have different nutrient species, how do those affect uh, a particular species of microalgae? But uh, uh, your point is a very good one and it's something that we have uh, recommended for future work because what we realize is that different species uptake uh, different, uh, sorry, different algal species uptake uh, different nutrient species differently and at uh, different rates and some thrive better in some conditions than others. So definitely if you have um, uh, a mixture of different species that can cope with uh, variations or, 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 or different uh, nutrients that might come in, depending on the, 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 the feeding, depending on the animals, etc. that would definitely be uh, something to uh, work on and, and look at. But the, 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 the important thing is to make sure that the species are, however, uh, robust. So Cladophora, as I mentioned, has been found as the main species in, in, in many environments, because although it doesn't uptake a lot of the nutrients uh, as much as others. It is very robust, it's very durable, um, and it can um, um, uptake a multitude of different end species. So you might have different species of Clodophora, and even within different species of Clodophora, they will behave differently. So having different ones would definitely be a, a, a way to go and studying these especially, but we did not do this because we simply did not have the time. Um, I don't know if this answered your question, uh, so I'll go to the next one. Uh, Ah, so the, the, again, a good question. Uh, if I didn't mention it, I should have. Um, so these algae, the reason why I wanted to test Clodophora is because aquaculture is a, a big industry in Scotland. Um, and therefore we uh, wanted to use uh, algal species that would be uh, native to this, to um, um, to Scotland potentially. So I, I, I showed a, a graph of where a particular species of Clodophora uh, was found in. So the main, so one thing that we wanted is to use native species because they're also already exposed to the environment that they would be uh, in, in a way. So species that thrive in Scotland obviously are better for use in a, in a Scottish environment and that applies anywhere else. Uh, so we wanted to use native species for this reason because they have evolved to, to cope with, uh, with the lack of sunshine and, the, and the too much rain. <laughs> But anyway, so they have evolved to cope with this. Um, but the other thing that we were testing in an aquaculture environment was focusing more on uh, land-based uh, uh, systems. Um, so that these are completely separate from uh, open systems that are used in the sea. Um, so these you can control much better what you are uh, uh, growing, what you are using, because they're closed systems and they're land-based. Uh, saying this, uh, another reason to use native species is precisely because then uh, if they show promise, then they can be used in uh, open uh, environments because they are already there. Uh, so you are reducing, although you obviously need to make a, an, an, an uh, impact assessment for this. Uh, so you, ha you, you are effectively reducing the, the risk of them taking over because they are uh, effectively already there. But the, the, we were focusing more on um, land-based uh, recirculating uh, aquaculture systems fully and not the open cages that you see in the uh, ocean, but it, it's applicable as well. Many thanks. I just wonder if there is any other question uh, that you could have to Dr. Simiano. I should put my video on actually. <laughs> Sorry, one day I'll, I'll learn <laughs> the system fully. <laughs> no problem, thank you. Uh, I guess that there is no more question. Yeah, okay. um, if there is any question, please feel free to send an email to Dr. Simiano, yes, right? Please, we'll 
please do because I, I wanted to, to talk about the work that we did on, on the, the, the nutrient part, which is actually quite interesting. We have published the, the, the we have published the work already. So if, if, if you don't feel like talking to me, obviously you can look at our paper, but please do send me any questions or any emails. I'm more than happy to answer them. Awesome. Uh Awesome. Thank you uh, very much. So we got just a thanks message from Sancha and then from okay. Claire. Um, thank so uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Simeno, for giving this compelling talk. And um, I believe that the internet connection is not very well. So uh, Professor Xinjiang from China could not give her um, concluding okay. mark uh, to say thank you. And so on behalf to uh, on behalf of Professor Xin and then on behalf of the organizing team of the IAS, I would love to thank again on the on our speaker uh, and on our students who made it. And hopefully we could organize in the future uh, other uh, workshop and other yeah, um, yeah. conference like that and that could uh, help to have more exchange and more yeah. uh, collaboration within the IAS uh, network. Yeah. Uh, well, so, hopefully I can, I can present the rest of the work that I did manage to present. Of here. course. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and anyway, there is a conference holding, uh, holding at, uh, in Edinburgh right, yeah. very soon, right? So likely the, uh, our own our, our student here going to meet you probably. Oh, cool in Perfect. Edinburgh and then that could um, promote new exchange and then they can uh, get information that you need yeah. uh, from talking to you. Wonderful. And, I, and I'm hoping Portugal is winning 2-0 at this stage. <laughs> yeah, because they take on the band, pa uh, the band pass from uh, internet, so they have to. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers so. crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was my pleasure and I, I would be more than happy to, to give a talk again in the future. It's perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. And then we're going to uh, circulate the information. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And, bye. Uh, bye bye.